The Mongols' rule over China lasted for a little more than a hundred years. The great Yuan Empire of the Mongol horsemen came and went like a mighty blast of wind. The last Yuan Emperor, Tohon Timur, posthumously known as Emperor Shun, reigned for 35 years, one year longer than the dynasty's founder, Kublai Khan. Tohon Timur experienced the ups and downs of a long reign, from growth to depression to decay. He strove to be a great ruler, and he wanted to restore the dynasty's fortunes. Then he tried to arrest its rapid decline. But the Yuan dynasty declined as rapidly as it did because of long-standing ills in its political system. During Emperor Shun's reign, they grew worse and worse. They were beyond the power of one man to solve. As conflicts and rebellions erupted across China, the machinery of empire broke down more rapidly than ever. All the emperor could do was watch as the Yuan Empire collapsed. After the death of Kublai Khan, a bloody power struggle took place inside the imperial family. In the course of 35 years, a total of seven emperors fought their way to the Yuan throne. In 1329, Kutugtu Khan, who had spent many years in exile in Central Asia, was summoned back to the capital, Dadu, now Beijing. En route, he proclaimed himself Emperor Mingzung, but before they could reach the capital, he and his wife were poisoned. Only their 10-year-old son, Tohon Timur, was spared. Tohon Timur was to become the last Yuan emperor. Born in exile, he had had a tough childhood, full of difficulty and danger. But his troubles were only just beginning. When Emperor Mingzung's brother, Wenzung, ascended the throne, he announced to the empire that Tohon Timur was not Mingzung's biological son. The ten-year-old was immediately forced into renewed exile, thanks to the scheming of his uncle Wenzong. Wenzong曾经下过一个诏书，报告中外，然后说呢，他的哥哥明宗曾经说过，托宽铁木尔不是他的亲生儿子。然后以此为借口呢，把托宽铁木尔流放。实际上，是这个图铁木尔，就是文宗啊，呃，有意制造这样一个谎言。这就是涉及到这个皇位继承的问题，因为按照这个约定呢，呃，文宗就图铁木
He had a lifelong interest in drawing up architectural plans and building wooden models. His excellence in these fields earned him the nickname Emperor Lu Bun, after the Chinese god of builders and carpenters. Unfortunately, his designs and the temple where he lived are lost in the mists of time. He had already seen the darker side of life. His days of exile and the beautiful scenery of the south allowed him to forget, however temporarily, the rigors of the imperial court. Little did he realize that in the capital, the same family members who had murdered his father were hatching new intrigues. He was about to be thrust into the center of the political stage. In August 1332, Tohon's uncle, Emperor Wenzung, died. After weighing up political and family interests, the Empress Dowager Buddha Shiri and the powerful minister El Timur chose the late emperor's eldest son, Rinchinbao, as the new Khan. He would be known as Emperor Ningzung. When the new emperor died just 53 days after taking the throne, they chose Tohon Timur. Tohon Timur in the past few years, he was born in the early years. This time, the time was very calm. Then he had a lot of time to learn the language. So, he was born in the past few years. He was born in the past few years. In fact, only one of them was born in the past. 可以呃写汉诗，呃说汉话。他当政之后呢，这些对他的这个施政方针呢，应该说会产生不小的影响。Late in 1332, after three years of exile in the south, Tohon Timur was able to return to Dadu. At a reception of welcome at Liangsheng, south of the capital, he met El Timur for the first time. The minister's demeanor was arrogant as he reported court affairs and told the young emperor what he ought to do. Tohon Timur listened in silence. This unsettled the minister, who wondered whether Tohon might be secretly plotting against him. Little did he know that the 13-year-old was silent only because he was scared. Tohon Timur was finally back in Dadu, a strange place for him. But the road from exile to becoming a ruler was still a rocky one. El Timur began a whispering campaign that if Tohon Timur were to become emperor, chaos would follow. As a result, Tohon's accession to the throne was postponed. His family has a connection with the Ming Zhong. Now, his son has a attitude so cruel or cold. He feels afraid. So, although the Tohon Timur was invited to the Dadu, he did not let the Tohon Timur be invited. So, before the Tohon Timur was invited, the Tohon Timur was not invited to the Dadu. What happened next surprised everyone. Nervous about the teenager's return, El Timur took to drinking and womanizing. In May 1333, he fell ill and died, finally clearing the way for Tohon Timur's accession. The teenager became the new Khan. He would be known to history as Emperor Shun of Yuan. But the young emperor remained in the shadow of another minister from the previous court. Following the death of El Timur, the void was filled by the Mongol general Bo Yan. After his tumultuous childhood, Tohon Timur did not take the imperial way of life for granted. He had learned from his short-lived predecessors that it was safer to stay in the palace and leave affairs of state to the ministers. 
He seemed still immersed in the landscape of Guilin and its peaceful way of life. But withdrawing from court life was, in any case, a wise move. Although El Timor was dead, his family still had a strong influence at court. El Timor's daughter had become Tohon Timor's empress. National affairs were still managed by El Timor's younger brother and sons. But Boyan was rapidly building up his strength, making a bloody clash between the two families inevitable. In the end, Boyan stripped El Timor's family of all their influence, giving the emperor what was probably his best day since his accession. Tohon Timur, in the last eight years, is actually the rise of Wenzhou era, the rise of the Wuchang Republic. In this eight years, we can divide it into two stages. The first stage is the Yuan-Tong era. At that time, the Yen Timur family and the Yen Timur family were united. The second stage is the Hojiu era. It was mainly the Yen Timur era of the Yen Timur era. 在这八年期间呢，燕呃托坤铁木尔呢，基本上待在宫中，呃，无所作为。In November 1335, Tohon Timur proclaimed the start of the Ji Yuan era, adopting the same era name as his illustrious ancestor Kublai Khan had used for most of his 31-year reign. The young ruler was determined to become a great emperor like Kublai Khan or Emperor Taizung of Tang. But his ambitions were thwarted by Bo Yan, the very man who had helped him get rid of El Timor's influence. Bo Yan's power and influence were even greater than El Timor's had been. After eliminating El Timor's remaining followers, Bo Yan was appointed Chancellor of the Right and later became the sole Chancellor. He held many other positions and multiple titles at the same time, which was unprecedented in the Yuan dynasty. Tohon Timor began to worry about Bo Yan. In response to a number of rebellions, Bo Yan introduced laws prohibiting Han Chinese and Southerners from possessing any weapons or horses. The laws were so strict as to ban even iron farm tools. Bo Yan hated the Han Chinese. It is said that he even proposed exterminating all those with the most common surnames, Zhang, Wang, Liu, Li, and Zhao. Wiping them out, he supposedly said, would be the most effective way to prevent future rebellions. This is the and it's Ever since the Sui and Tang dynasties, the imperial examinations had been the major instrument for the selection of top officials. Early in the Yuan dynasty, the examination system was abolished. But under Emperor Renzung, it was reinstated. The Mongol rulers used it to attract scholars to work for them, especially Han Chinese scholars. Soon after Bo Yan seized power, he took the advice of Governor Cheli Timur to abolish the examinations in an obvious attempt to suppress the Han Chinese and Southerners. In April 1337, he banned Han Chinese and Southerners from learning Mongolian and other minority languages to keep them from getting positions in government. Tohon Timur grew increasingly fearful and resentful of Bo Yan's autocratic rule. The older the emperor grew, the more vulnerable and frustrated he felt. To be able to break free from the minister's control and realize his own ambitions, 
Tohon Timur began to make a plan for his political future. When internal conflict emerged in Boyan's political circle, Tohon Timur knew that he needed to seize his opportunity. He found the next man he could rely on, the censor-in-chief Tuo Tuo, who was also Boyan's nephew. This was his principle throughout his long reign. He did not push ideas of his own, but tried to balance one political force with another. Tuo 就开始呢，试探着跟托欢铁木尔顺地进行沟通。In In fact, almost everyone around Tohon Timur was reporting to Bo Yan, except for two men. Toto approached these two and told them he was willing to finish his uncle for the greater good. Tohon Timur was delighted by the plan, but remained cautious. He sent a trusted agent to talk to Tuoto several times before deciding to align with him. Then he met Tuoto and they developed a plan to dismiss Bo Yan. In February 1340, with the Emperor's backing, Tuoto launched a coup while Bo Yan was on a hunting trip in Liu Lin. A statement of accusation against Bo Yan was written overnight and delivered to Liu Lin the next day. Deserted by his guards, Bo Yan was exiled to the southern province of Guangdong and put to death en route. The widow of the late emperor Wen Zhong and their son El Tegus were also banished and put to death. Tohon Timur had now cleared every remaining obstacle from Emperor Wen Zhong's era. For the first time, he felt like a true emperor. Filled with fresh ambition, he set out to revive his empire. In January 1341, he declared the start of the Jijiang era, meaning back on the right track. He appointed Tuoto as the right grand chancellor of the secretariat, and Tuoto commenced a program known as the reform of Jijiang. 更化措施呢许多后续的更化措施是由顺帝亲自主持的所以呢称为智政更化呢比称为托托更化呢更妥当一些 The Temple of Confucius at the east end of Imperial College Street in Beijing's Dongcheng district dates from 1302 after relocating to Dadu, Kublai Khan wanted to preserve traditional Han Chinese culture. He ordered the construction of a grand temple to commemorate Confucius, with an imperial college beside it. The complex became the highest educational institution in the Yuan, Ming and Qing dynasties. Inside the temple, stone tablets record the names of the Jinxi, the successful candidates in the imperial examinations. There are over 50,000 names on 198 tablets. Only three tablets are from the Yuan dynasty. Now 
Potro reinstated the imperial examination. He redressed injustices, lifted the ban on owning horses, and reduced taxes, such as the salt tax, so easing ethnic tensions that Bo Yan's autocratic rule had stirred up. The Imperial College attracted more than 3,000 students from the Mongol, Sermu, and Han groups. Tuoto selected outstanding Confucian officials to present their views to the emperor. Tohon Timur also spent a great deal of time talking to Confucian scholars and studying Han Chinese literature and philosophy in the Xuanwen Pavilion, or Hall for the Diffusion of Literature, which he founded. Under Tuoto's administration, the Unified Criminal Code, the Universal Code of Great Yuan, was revised and reintroduced in 1346. The revised code was named the Jijang Code. Tuotuo also sponsored the completion of the long overdue histories of the Liao, Jin and Sung dynasties. Jin 还是辽一直定不下来所以一直拖到元顺帝的元末了这个时候是拖拖出来定下来的拖拖就一句话三朝各为正统编三不离史那么就出现了宋史辽史金史所以这也是一个非常伟大的创举 Backed by the Emperor, Tuoto's program of reform was effective in many areas, generating hopes of the Empire's revival. During the reforms, Tohon Timur had a few years of peace. He stayed in the palace, leaving the decision-making to Tuotuo. The emperor had talents apart from politics. He had a good understanding of astronomy and even devised a water clock. According to the history of Yuan, the water clock was a sophisticated device with multiple automatic time reporting functions. Unfortunately, it has been lost. But like the water in the clock, the power of the Yuan dynasty, which even the Western world had once feared, was ebbing away in its last days. In 1344, Tuotuo resigned, owing to ill health, but also owing to a monk's advice that the year was inauspicious for him. He submitted his resignation 17 times before Tohon Timur reluctantly accepted it. At this time, Mongol and Sermu aristocrats enjoyed privileged lives. They were allowed to take over private lands, even as commoners suffered extreme hardship. Natural disasters and civil unrest were widespread. In Hebei province alone, more than 3,000 robberies were reported. Even areas close to Dadu were affected. Mongol rule in China was reaching a crisis point. Although the reforms did bring improvements, these were on the surface. They made things look better and relieved the tension between the Mongol rulers and the Han Chinese population. But the reforms did not address the underlying social conflicts between classes. As a result, they were not enough to save the dynasty from collapse. Faced with such difficulties, Tohon Timur returned once again to his old ally, Tuotuo. In 1349, the ninth year of the Jijang era, Tuotuo was recalled to the court after a five-year absence. He began another administrative reform. These notes were issued in 1260, the first year of Kublai Khan's Jungtong era. 
Paper currency was used from the start of the Yuan dynasty. The printing of notes increased dramatically late in Kublai's reign, and the practice continued into later reigns. Counterfeiting was widespread. The Yuan government offered large rewards to anyone reporting a forgery. This note says, death penalty applies to forger, five dings of silver reward to informant. An offender's assets would be forfeited and given to the person who reported the offence. In 1350, Tuo Tuo introduced a currency reform. He printed new Jijiang notes and issued Jijiang Tungbao copper coins. Zhong 所以说变超呢, While commoners struggled to make ends meet, the Mongol and Sermu aristocrats and the emperor lived extravagantly. The emperor often rewarded the privileged with property and turned a blind eye to their industrial and commercial monopolies and land grabs. Dadu was the key to the government's revenue, generating more than a tenth of the total business tax. But most of its businesses were in the hands of the privileged, princes and princesses, high officials, loan sharks, and major monasteries. Tohon Timur himself was also enjoying a life of luxury. For the palace lake, he ordered the construction of a huge dragon boat, which he had designed himself. The boat is said to have been wonderfully luxurious. It was colorfully painted and trimmed with gold and had its own heating, pagoda and pavilions. But the emperor did not seem to realize that his ship of state was about to sink. Ma Zhuang village in Henan province near the Yellow River. The grain is ripe after the summer rain. This is the busiest time of year for the farmers. Heavy rain has brought a bumper crop, and Mr. Hu has called on his two sons, who are students in the city, to help him in the fields. They do not know that hundreds of years ago, the land they are working on was underwater. The Yellow River the mother river of the Chinese nation, wanders across the central plains like a dragon. She nurtures the Chinese culture, but she can also bring disaster. The course of the Yellow River has shifted many times. Floods during the Zhejiang years left millions homeless and discontented. Damage to canals and to salt works posed a serious threat to the economy. After his return to office, Tuo Tuo followed the advice of the engineer Jia Lu to divert the river back to its original course. The project began in April 1351. It required a huge workforce and an immense expenditure, but it was successfully completed in November of the same year. But peasants were forced to work on the project while also bearing the burden of providing materials. Overseers mistreated them and even withheld rations. In 1351, a local rebellion spiraled into the nationwide Red Turban Rebellion, which would end a century of Mongol rule in China. It began in May, 
when a rebellion broke out in Yingzhou in Anhui province. It was organized by leaders of the White Lotus cult, who had buried a one-eyed stone figure in the riverbed. Engraved on its back were the words, the one-eyed stone man will overthrow the rulers. They then circulated a prophecy that a one-eyed stone man would lead the Yellow River laborers to overthrow the government. When the figure was discovered, the news spread like wildfire. The laborers rose in revolt with the red turban as their symbol. They were joined by peasants and laborers across the country. The Yuan court was thrown into crisis. Having enjoyed the luxuries of imperial life for just a few years, Tohon Timor had no wish to return to chaos. He and Tuotuo used the army to suppress the rebellion. With the cooperation of local warlords, they gradually brought the situation under control. In 1352, Tuotuo and his army took Shuzhou and killed Ji Ma Li, a red turban leader. Two years later, he launched an attack against Zheng Shicheng, a rebel leader in control of Gao Yo. Having suffered several defeats and facing an army a million strong, Zheng Shicheng was contemplating surrender when suddenly he heard some startling news. Tuotuo's rivals at court, the brothers Hama and Shi Shi, had made an allegation against him that the emperor had believed. The emperor had stripped Tuotuo of all his positions and banished him. Tuotuo's dismissal in the middle of the siege of Gaoyo demoralized his men. The red turbans seized their opportunity. Many of Tuotuo's former troops deserted and joined the red turbans or other rebels like Zhang Shicheng. Tapi this is the tomb of Tuo Tuo, in the city of Xingtai, Hebei province. The local residents are descendants of Tuo Tuo. During his exile in Yunnan, the great chancellor who had contributed so much to the Yuan dynasty was murdered by order of Hama. Tuo Tuo's death increased internal friction and undoubtedly accelerated the dynasty's decline. According to one minister, after his death, the military was weakened, money was wasted, law and order were disrupted, and the people suffered. If Tuotuo were still alive, none of this would have happened. Shundi 评价为这个贤相 Luoyang, Hernan. In this residential precinct, the military leader Cha Han Timur was buried. Now only a grave mound is left. Not even the local residents know its story. But in the last years of the Yuan dynasty, Chahan Timur and his nephew and adopted son, Koka Timur, were prominent in the fight against the rebels. For in the chaos, local warlords became the main leaders on the battlefield. Chohan Timur was losing his authority and the empire's dominance was fading. To help suppress the Red Turban rebels, the government had to rely on forces assembled by warlords. At the same time, tensions between the Emperor, Empress Qi, and their son, Crown Prince Ayu Shiridara, became apparent to all. 
As a result, the court and the local powers sided either with the emperor or the crown prince and went to war with each other. Yanchindi 军阀之间混战比较厉害 Faced with intrigues and rivalries, Tohon Timur was losing his spirit and ambition to govern. Challenged by internal and external conflicts, he grew frustrated and helpless. He became passive, indulging himself in imperial extravagance. The emperor barely set foot outside the palace. He no longer concerned himself with architecture or affairs of state. Instead, he spent his days indulging in tantric rituals from Tibetan Buddhism and the 16 demons dance. Although Tohon Timur was lucky enough to escape a coup planned by his own family, he was no longer able to hold the collapsing empire together. In the summer of 1368, rebels led by Shuda and Chang Yu Chun fought their way to the capital. All the while, internal wars between warlords Kokil Timur and Li Si Chi continued in Hernan. When Tungzhou, the gateway to the capital, fell to the rebels, Tohon Timur met overnight with his ministers to discuss an escape to Shangdu. He paced around the hall saying, I won't be humiliated like the last Song emperors. Faced with disaster, the fragmented imperial family put their grudges aside and reunited. That same night, Tohon Timur and his court, including Empress Qi, the Crown Prince and the ministers fled through the Jiandu Gate, bound for Shangdu. On the 14th of September, 1368, Dadu fell to Ming forces, marking the end of the Yuan dynasty. The Mongol imperial family retreated to the Mongolian steppe and retained their imperial titles, becoming known as the Northern Yuan dynasty. Northern Yuan went on fighting the Ming army and achieved some notable victories, giving rise to a brief resurgence in the Xuanguang era under Ayu Shiridara. But the dynasty gradually declined and finally split into the Tatars and the Oirats, who continued fighting the authorities in central China. Uh, 但是呢,這只是導火索。The site of the ancient city of Yingchang, 500 kilometers from Dadu. This is where Tohon Timur spent his last days. In 1369, the year after his dynasty fell, Tohon Timur retreated to Yingchang on the Inner Mongolian steppe. In April 1370, the third year of the Ming dynasty's Hongwu era, he died of dysentery at the age of 51. This emperor with great ambitions became a tragic figure the last emperor of his dynasty. History does not record the mood of the dying ruler as he witnessed the collapse of his empire. 
It is not known how Tohon Timor viewed his achievements. But the rise and fall of this nomadic empire had a great impact on the world. Genghis Khan's horsemen shocked the world as they swept out of the grasslands. Later, Kublai Khan led the army southward, charging into the heartland of China and founding the mighty Yuan Empire. But in the end, the bold nomads returned to the steppes from whence they came. The plight of the once great emperor was as bleak as the grassland in which he hid. But within just 100 years, his empire had left a significant mark on the world. History is written by the victors. After his death, Tohon Timor's ministers gave him the title of Emperor Huizung, honorary ancestor. But the first emperor of the Ming dynasty, Zhu Yuanzhang, believed Tohon Timor was an emperor who obediently followed heaven's decree and called him Emperor Shun, meaning one who follows his destiny. And so Tohon Timor went down in history as Emperor Shun of Yuan.